give a bit more information on what does it actually mean to breathe toxic air on a regular basis. And the figures and the feedbacks we are uh, getting back uh, pro prove us that we, we did really a good job all together with our partners. We have managed, um, we started as a group of eight enthusiastic organizations and we have managed to directly include around 520 organizations and initiatives. Um, our social, it was mainly a social media campaign uh, where we got, got a reach out altogether of almost 700,000 and um, traditional media also paid attention. So we had around 500 interviews, announcements, articles. So I think it was really successful in bringing complex issues of what does air pollution mean um, to, to citizens that were maybe not that much involved. And um, the good thing is that the campaign is over, but that the working atmosphere was so good and that we see that this can only be done regionally so that we have decided to transform it into a regional network. Uh, as was the campaign, so will the network remain open. So if anybody wants to join us with, with concrete activities, initiatives, ideas, please feel free. This event, I would even place it like this. It's the first event of our network so that we see what are the next steps, what are the possible solutions, how can we transform what we see on a daily basis into a policy level, what is there already on a policy level. Um, we have the Green Agenda, the Green Deal, we have the Berlin Process, we have the Civil Society Forum, we have so many different things and we will try to structure them today a little bit to see how they belong together. The green agenda that has been signed uh, last November under the auspices of the Berlin process uh, and that all our decision makers and leaders stick to, let's see what's the potential really um, and uh, what is the role of civil society. Um, which brings me to another part of the Berlin process, and that is the civil society facility. And I'm very happy that we have one of the organizers of, um, the civil, of this year's civil society with us. The German government has given um, the mandate to the Aspen Institute Berlin and the Südosteuropa Gesellschaft. And we have with us the deputy executive director and the program director for Europe of the Aspen Institute Berlin, Valeska Esch will tell us a bit more how far have they come with the preparation, what is the concept of this year's civil society forum, um, why have you decided to place the green agenda really prominently on your agenda and where do you see the room for experts in civil society to really be heard, um, not just to speak up but to actually be heard. So Valeska, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to briefly introduce our plans for this year's Civil Society Forum of the Berlin Process. Good morning, everyone, um, and thanks for, for, for joining in. Uh, we really are looking forward to the opportunity of hosting this jointly together with uh, Southeast Europe Association. And actually, <clears throat> what we plan to do is we will host two fora, uh, one, the Civil Society Forum part one, uh, Road to Berlin, which um, serves as a preparation forum and will take place on the 1st and 2nd of June. Unfortunately, of course, due to the um, pandemic that is still um, uh, omnipresent in our lives, we, we will only be able to host this online. Um, and the Civil Society Forum Part 2, Berlin 2021, which will take place around or during the summit. And for that one, the date and also the format are still to be confirmed. Uh, when it comes to the Road to Berlin Forum, uh, we will have a combination of a series of panel discussions, which uh, will also include officials from government or different institutions that are involved in the Berlin process. And, and this already um, answers part of, part of your question, Alexandra, in, in terms of how civil society can be heard and can contribute. We will dedicate quite some time of the forum to parallel working groups in which civil society and think tank experts will have the chance in smaller groups to discuss along two main issues. Um, on the one hand, 
strengthening civil society cooperation in the respective field of that working group and sharing best practices. And on the other hand, the development of policy recommendations for that specific topic of the working group, which will then feed into the preparation process of the Berlin uh, summit. Um, <clears throat> the topics that we are planning to address will largely reflect the agenda of the Berlin process, both in previous years and also what we anticipate to be on this year's agenda. So we will cover a wide range of issues, including reconciliation, minorities, role of civil society in strengthening democracy, disinformation and media independence, the connectivity agenda, common regional market, and also the overall goal and outlook on the Berlin process as such. And last not but, but not least, and Alexandra, you already mentioned that we will have a focus on the green agenda for the Western Balkans with one panel and um, three working groups altogether. And those working groups will focus on energy transition, air pollution, biodiversity and nature conservation. Uh, yeah, why that strong focus is, is, is what you asked. And, and the reason is that we are very much convinced that the green agenda for the Western Balkans is of utmost importance for the entire region and not for its elites, not for a small group of people, but for every single citizen. It's a question of quality of life and personal health if you breathe clean air, which is obviously the topic of today's discussion. Um, uh, losing biodiversity is a threat to entire ecosystem, and that also is not an isolated problem, but it affects many other issues such as agriculture, clean water supplies, uh, but also countries' attractiveness of a tourist destination. So in my view, even if, if you don't really care about environment protections, there are many economic factors at play here as well. Energy transition not only goes to serve to improving the quality of air, but also to reducing energy dependence. So these issues are very closely interlinked, as we can see also with some of the renewable energy projects in the Western Balkans, which are at the same time a threat to entire ecosystems. I'm thinking of the Vyosa River, for example, as one of the, one of the current examples. The Green Agenda is a holistic approach, and it, it needs to be implemented as such. And, uh, sustainability and environmental protections are not national issues. So this is also something that, in my view, comes natural to the idea of the Berlin process. Rivers flow through several countries, air does not stop at boundaries, climate change and pollution are global challenges, and the Balkans being part of Europe is, uh, is included in Europe's efforts of addressing those challenges. And I believe it's not only in the interest of the European Union to work closely with the Western Balkans on this, but it's also in the interest of, of the Western Balkans itself. All six countries aim for EU membership. And while I understand that the uh, EU integration process has been very slow and membership seems far away, if, if the Balkans do not start addressing the issues included in the Green Agenda, it will only move further away because the EU, while not being maybe perfect itself in environmental standards, it is... Uh, going in, in, in the right direction. It has opted for a rather ambitious Green Deal. Funds are increasingly going to be conditioned on sustainabilities, so standards are only going to move further apart if this is not addressed. And finally, and I would close with that, um, I see a very important role also for civil society organizations and think tanks in this topic. Raising awareness among citizens being one of them, in the end of the day, this is closely linked to each and every one of us and our individual behavior when it comes to consumption, waste, travel, etc. And um, I mean, this event and, and, and the European Fund for the Balkans initiatives when it comes to clean air are the best examples, in my view, as to how important a role civil society organizations and think tanks can play. Monitoring implementation, we all know it's a challenge, not only in this region, um, but, uh, but, but overall, and in this region, maybe a bit more, more strongly, but monitoring implementation, in my view, is an important role for civil society organizations in the Green Agenda as well. Advocacy for implementation, raising awareness also internationally, petitions such as for the Vyosa River or the Ulcin Salina, for example, have reached Germany and have caught even here a, a bit of attention. So yeah, in a nutshell, these are just some of the reasons why we believe the Green Agenda for the Western Balkans is very important and deserves the focus of this year's Civil Society Forum between, as I said, the many other issues that we also cover. I would leave it at that. I, as I said, we look forward to hosting this with our friends and partners of Southeast Europe Association. We look forward to contributions um, on this and other issues from civil society and think tanks from across the region. 
Invitations have not been sent yet. Um, and if you would like to contribute to this year's forum, I will uh, just in a couple minutes um, post an email address um, in the chat. So feel free to write to us. Um, we, we, we look forward to hearing from you and your contributions. So thanks again for, for this opportunity. And um, I look forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you, Valeska. Yes, please do share an email address with us and then we can also spread it uh, even beyond this, this panel so that you really get uh, interesting people for the forum, especially as it is, it is online. So capacities uh, are, are different than when it is in person. Um, we trust that you will manage to bring uh, the recommendations and everything what civil society has to do to the real decision makers. Um, always the products of the Civil Society Forum are, are interesting, are valuable, and also leave space to work with them afterwards. But uh, the, the main um, additional value and added value of the forum is to have the decision makers so close by. So all trust of us is in you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we will say goodbye now and turn to the panel. Thank you. Thanks for having me, bye. So uh, the Green New Deal was also mentioned by, by Valeska. It was already water, the green, not the Green New Deal, the European Green Deal, see? So it's so much of terminology. It has already been watered down. So they've already reduced the 60% reduction just this morning to in the European Parliament to what is it, 56 or 57 now. So we see, uh, we see that facts and science-based proof and what is already always so easily uh, packed as evidence-based policy making in reality and even in most developed uh, administrations and bureaucracies not that easy and not that natural as one would think so let's let's turn to our region um, we have uh, today a great panel i will introduce them in, in more detail once i give them the word but we have here present Sarajevo, Yavoskopia, and Belgrade. So the most polluted cities are, are here. Um, let's see how the green agenda that has been signed by all the uh, governmental representatives last November, uh, how it will be implemented, um, how optimistic are we about that, um, how far has it been understood, and where is the role for civil society. And I would like to start by giving the words to Tanya Mischevich. She is Deputy Secretary General of the Regional Cooperation Council. Um, she is, but currently on leave, Professor of uh, the Faculty of Political Science in Belgrade. And she used to be the head of the negotiation team for the accession uh, process of the Republic of Serbia. And basically in Serbia, she is the main source of knowledge when it comes to EU integration processes. So. Thank you very much for being with us today, Tanya, and the word is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Alexandra. Um, thank you for the interesting uh, introduction. Uh, now I am obliged to provide uh, <laughs> more information, but uh, actually I am uh, grateful for you to invite me to participate in this type of event as the environmental protection and climate change basically constitute chapter 27, one of the most important chapters of the negotiation process, yet uh, one of the most expensive, not one of, definitely the most expensive uh, chapter for the full implementation and obviously, the agenda for not only uh, countries negotiating membership, but also all others um, discussing uh, any type of uh, connection with the European Union, being that membership or the privilege partnership or being only an economic exchange, uh, that is going to uh, influence enormously each and every of the EU partners. For us in the region, when I'm talking about the region, uh, uh, of course, uh, I, I could concentrate on SE, which is 12 economies, or Western Balkan 6, which is uh, six economies from the region. And I will concentrate on them because green agenda is definitely something that belongs to the Western Balkan, uh, Western Balkan 6. So 
uh, uh, let me try to delineate two documents. So Green Deal, uh, which was adopted two years ago, if I'm not wrong, the second half of 2019. Uh, so almost two, uh, two years ago, had inside it one as the priority areas to prepare the green agenda for the Western, Western Balkan, which will be in accordance with this, uh, with this document. And it took them something like a year to prepare the document, but actually it ended up preparing the guidelines of the implementation of the Green Agenda and the very document, the declaration of the Green Agenda for the Western Balkan, which was accepted last uh, November uh, in Sofia, uh, is document owned by the Western Balkan Six. Uh, why uh, is important to have that in mind? Because it is our agenda. It's not EU invoked, but uh, um, bottom up uh, agenda that all six uh, Western Balkan economies accepted as their own goal uh, to share and also to reach the implementation. Um, you are a um, much better expert than uh, and your participants in the area of the environmental protection and climate change. So um, I'm not uh, going uh, into the details of the very Agenda, as you, of course, know it by heart, but just to stress that this is uh, closely connected with uh, the idea of creating common regional market, which means the economic integration of the Western Balkans on the path towards membership to the European Union, something like a stepping stone towards the, um, the membership to the European Union, but never, uh, uh, nevertheless, to stress out the importance of the several issues like the decarbonization or the circular economy or the depollution uh, and um, definitely sustainable food system and rural areas and biodiversity will have or should have on the development uh, uh, of on the economic social uh, sustainable development uh, uh, for the for the region um, uh, so where are we right now in terms of the uh, green agenda um, we are now obliged to prepare, but not alone, uh, to prepare together with the national economies, uh, that means all six from the region, uh, the plan for the implementation, for not only um, enlisting the measures which are regional and national in terms of the implementation of the agenda, but also um, to prepare a plan which will be um, implementable, which will be inclusive, big words, but nevertheless, it means to prepare a plan which really uh, will bring the results, EA, that in few years' time you do not consider Sarajevo, Belgrade, or um, uh, any other capital of Kopje, or any other capital of the Western Balkan Six as being the most polluted towns in the world, but quite contrary, that we are lowering down uh, the, uh, the share of pollution, which um, is one of the issues that are important not only to us, uh, people living here, but also to the leaders. And we are going to use that interest of the leaders for promoting uh, uh, this type of development. Um, and so we are working right now with the European Commission, but also national uh, authorities to pick up their brains in terms of how they envisage the implementation. And I have to uh, tell you that um, not because I am originally from Serbia, but Serbia did the, uh, the biggest leap forward because they presented the climate law 
which is uh, uh, the uh, novelty and uh, breaking through uh, in this respect, but also they, they produce their own action plan for the implementation of the green agenda. And uh, um, uh, we are discussing the same level with all others in terms of that uh, the implementation will have a regional level of uh, the activities that is going to be produced by RCC, but also biodiversity task force that's then standing group on the rural development, even uh, World Health Organization. Basically, we are talking about the health of people in that respect, which will be the overarching the activities of each and every of the uh, of the Western Balkan six. This document should be uh, adopted, endorsed, whatever will be the format during the summit that is envisaged for the Slovenian presidency. And of course, that we are aiming at Slovenians as being very closely attached to the region, which is one of the uh, extremely important uh, uh, things to have in mind, but also that the Slovenians envisage the environmental protection and climate change as one of the priorities of their presidency to the Council of the European Union. And that is important. So we are working now in order to have enough time for the consultations, not only with the national authorities, but also with the national parliaments, for civil society equally important player as the civil so, uh, as the parliaments are the legislator of all of the activities and if we are talking about the um, uh, the uh, harmonization with the standards that are needed that means a lot of work not only for the executive but also for the le legislative activity that means the parliament and also parliament is actually the the place for the hearings and for the activity of exchange with the uh, civil society during the process of the, uh, of the harmonization. So the parliament, but also we would like also to have the exchange, the consultation with the civil society regional and also national on the content uh, of this document. And let me finish with the aim, the document to be the uh, a real um, um, a roadmap of a steps that has to be taken, but credible steps that has to be taken in credible in terms of the possibilities, but also funds that are going to be provided uh, for this type of activity. Is it possible? It is. I know it is. Uh, uh, it, of course, will have to have both support of the highest political level, but also grass to, uh, or, uh, the, um, the civil society organization to steer us uh, into uh, this direction. I will stop here. Uh, there will be a lot of opportunity to continue on some of those issues. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Back to you. Thank you, Tanya. Well, I like that you sound very optimistic. Um, and I really uh, play, uh, place a lot of uh, expectations myself into you, uh, into the RCC and its uh, consultation pro process, especially when we have in mind how the parliaments in some of our countries look like and um, how they are not really performing to their um, given role. I have to say I uh, got a bit stuck and, uh, well, maybe more disillusionalized when you said that the document of the Green Agenda is owned by our countries. But um, that just as a comment, uh, there are others at this panel who can maybe take up on that. Uh, I, uh, let me turn now to Sergian Kukoy, who is a health and energy advisor at um, the Health and Environmental Alliance, which is an organization that um, makes politicians and policymakers hear the importance of health evidence and health voices. Um, Sergian is um, in particularly prioritizing public health actions. Um, but he has a long track record in advocating for the right to equal access to health and uh, creating tools to improve the implementation of national and international legal obligations. So 
I think, Sarijan, you will have a lot to tell us about the Green Agenda and its uh, ways into our daily lives. And I have to add that Sarijan was also part of the Balkans United for Clean Air campaign with providing us um, with background knowledge when we speak about public health and health issues in relations with air pollution. So thank you for joining us, Sergio. Thank you, Alexander, for the invitation and thank you everyone for, who's joining the event. Um, and thank you for making the title of your um, event looks more healthier than the others we have in the region. Before I deep dive in, into the details of the Green Agenda and the other documents, I would just go back in the time when the Green Agenda was presented for the first time at the European Parliament and where a few members of Parliament actually asked whether the principle of the conditional financing would be introduced through the Economic and Investment Plan for the Western Balkans. Actually, as I understood, these members were concerned about the Western Balkans, which have so far uh, shown uh, no significant progress towards aligning with the EU policies. Um, I don't know uh, if any of those members were reading our announcements at the time because he'll also asking the, quest, um, the same questions to the European Commission because we were very concerned about this uh, amount of money planned to be transferred to um, IPA uh, funds and programs without the principle of conditional funding. Um, I think that is also still um, a very hot topic, hot question at the moment because we've seen that um, EU funds been coming to the region for a very long period of time and we also seen that the countries are not doing uh, well when it comes to the implementation but also uh, we would like to increase the question of monitoring of the implementation of those um, projects and programs in, in the region. Um, luckily we had the announcement of the Green Agenda for the Western Balkans um, year and a half ago and um, as a heel we've been very lucky and also happy to see that the air pollution in the Western Balkans been uh, very highlighted in th this document where they said that the air pollution in the Western Balkans remains one of the highest in the Europe and has a direct impact on the citizens health. As a heel we see that uh, even the word health it's not included and it's not part of the strategic documents in, the, uh, in countries in the region. And we do on a regular basis the analysis of the laws, bylaws, decisions, uh, strategies, action plans, any kind of, I mean, any kind of documents that belongs to the uh, legal framework, frameworks. And we've seen that the health is not really supported by the, by the decision makers and uh, on, on still a regular basis, we call on the Ministry of Health to, to increase the participation in decision-making when, when it comes to the um, environmental policies. Uh, just give you a very um, short example. The countries in the region have the public health strategies and even public health laws where the environment is a part of that documents. And there is also action plans saying which um, uh, action should be done in terms of um, air pollution and health. Uh, unfortunately, uh, ministries of health and um, other relevant public health institutions are not doing so much um, uh, in, in terms of providing the support, knowledge support, technical support to the environmental groups. So um, we want to see more um, health experts involved in decision making and also to be a part of the working groups working on uh, uh, on the development of the air, air quality um, documents, strategies, programs, any kind of documents that is uh, related to the decreasing the level of, of pollution in the region. So um, speaking about the green agenda, again, uh, the, uh, the, the document itself is speaking about different kinds of sources of pollution in the region, which where we are speaking about the industrial installations, um, energy sector, households, um, uh, transport, and many others. And uh, those, um, pollu this pollution has to be um, seen as a very big health concern. Not only about, we are not speaking only about the um, effects of air pollution on the citizen health, but also uh, effects on the budget and economies in the region, because um, as a heel, we also speaks about um, the health costs and a lot of people asking us the, you know, what, what does that mean? And so uh, just give you a, to give you an example, of, um, the, the citizens are already paying for the healthcare, you know, in, in those countries. And so 
if they've been affected by the air pollution and uh, you know struggling with the health um, difficulties, of course they're going to pay another amount of money for um, for the treatment and uh, you know for being um, uh, in, in daily care. So um, the the green agenda also speaking about industrial emissions, and I, I'm sure that everybody who's listening to this event is. Um, uh, aware of the, our reports specifically speaking about the coal uh, fleet in this region and we know that uh, the document itself also quoted our of one of the famous I would say reports from coal pollution for the Western Balkans when they said that the 16 um, uh, coal power plants in the region emit more SO2 than the uh, the same uh, 20, uh, 250 uh, plants in the uh, EU. So uh, I think that personally the main challenge is the implementation gap in general. And um, as all the Western Balkans partners um, or re uh, countries are recording exceedance of air quality standards for at least one pollutant in at least one of the locations. Uh, one of your previous um, speakers also mentioned uh, was uh, mentioned the uh, monitoring of the air quality in the region, and we know that we have uh, monitoring in place, but unfortunately we do not have you know the uh, full coverage, and also we saw that some of the countries are facing with uh, problems of procurement of more monitoring stations, also the, the very important uh, parts of the stations and in the equipment. So there is a lot of things that we can discuss about how the monitoring is actually implemented in the countries in the region. And as Hill and also the other uh, organization working on air quality, we are also struggling with, uh, I mean, reaching the information on um, air pollution in the region. So even we want to do the modeling of data or doing any kind of the analysis, we, we are having a huge problem to, to get exact data on the level of air pollution um, in the region. So um, also one of the, the documents that we should think about is the communication document from the commission on the green agenda, which also explains the, the what is the document about. and. Uh, one of the new things that actually um, has happening at the moment is the uh, launching the um, initiative called regions in transition platform in the Western Balkans and Ukraine. We have seen that the European Commission and their other partners uh, joined this initiative and also looking for a solution when it comes to the energy transition. We know that the energy transition itself is a very expensive thing, and we also are concerned about the people working in the mining fields, in the coal power plants. So it's a very huge process of transition, uh, which is going to happen in the region, but still we are asking, I mean, we, we're sending a message to the, the um, national authorities to um, go in line with the EU policies and also to meet the 2030 and 2050 tar tar targets. So um, I have to uh, mention one of the concerns we have about the uh, energy supplies in, in the region. And uh, we know that the gas, the fossil gas also will, um, is introduced in the region. And there is a lot of discussion about that as a hill. We recently published the briefing on just transition for health protection, actually speaking about why disease prevention and zero pollution uh, needs to be at the heart of the energy uh, investments. Uh, we know that, uh, and we are expecting the Western Balkan region being flooded by the gas very soon. And as a as the organization, I know as a part of the uh, larger group of the uh, organization initiatives, we do not uh, support the uh, investments in a fossil fuel gas um, industry because we need to consider that you know fossil fuel gas it's not a bridge technology, and uh, the burning of gas also leads to the air pollution and health impacts. And even investments in gas uh, will, you know, lock in air pollution for another 50 years uh, to come. So when, when, when actually the focus should be on reaching zero pollution as, as fast uh, as possible. And as you mentioned, there is a Sofia declaration on the green agenda for the Western Balkans, which actually speaks about the ratification of convention on uh, long range uh, transboundary air pollution, about the development and implementation of air quality strategies. Um, establishing adequate air quality monitoring system, system and uh, preparing and signing the Russian, uh, regional agreement on transboundary um, air pollution. 
So in order to move forward, I would say the Western Balkans really needs to take um, a lot of steps, but speaking from our side about the um, uh, air pollution and health um, and you know environmental health impacts in general, uh, we think that the countries in the region should conduct a health impact assessment for all industrial installations, energy sector, uh, domestic heating, transport, um, uh, and uh, this means that every project is assessed and for its potential effects, damages and benefits for, uh, for the health of population, both in the country concerned and also beyond. Um, also, those countries should identify prioritize measures that will provide for the greatest health uh, benefit. And because you know, we all know that the air pollution is a public threat and should be addressed through the strategy measures aimed at the healthier future and, and for sure economic growth of the region. Also, countries need to increase the participation of health experts in decision making to ensure that the timely integration of public health measures into environmental policies are in place. Uh, one of the important things is that the scientific evidence should be the backbone of the policy making uh, and the countries need to make decisions based on scientific evidence using the knowledge uh, of international or national scientific community. And one of the very important things when it comes to the decision making in the region, uh, we've seen the lack of uh, transparency in the work, unfortunately, the highest level of um, uh, corruption in the region. So we call the, that countries should encourage actually the public interest in decision making using the legal mechanism, which will ensure the high level of transparency in the work of public institutions and the efficiency in the implementation of laws and decisions in the field of industrial installation again, energy sector, domestic heating and transport should be increased in order to achieve uh, a greater health and economic benefit for all citizens. And um, in conclusion, I would say that he'll have a very strong position when it comes to the transition of the region, actually, uh, when it comes to the greening of the Western Balkans, and we call on the EU and the country leaders in the region to push the implementation of actions in order, of course, to meet um, 2030 and 2050 targets. I think that the region needs uh, strong leadership that will lead to the creation of the new opportunities for sure, and of course, a healthier environment and sustainability of Europe. And um, looking at the experience of other regions and other countries in the world, I guess that also this region needs to start collecting success stories and sharing lessons learned with the rest of the world. So. Yeah, I mean, we expect really that, that the Western Balkan legal leaders go in the line with the EU policies and really boost the implementation of the existing uh, uh, legal frameworks, but also to improve the, those actions and, and you know, in order to meet um, the, the healthier and, and, and more cleaner environment in future for, the, for, the, uh, for this region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergio. You draw a very complex picture of the importance of a multi-sectoral approach of actually working together on relying on science. I think that what we have witnessed over the past year, not only here, but globally, is that uh, this is not taking place, even when it's really acute and uh, I think less so when it's something still abstract as climate change is. So we have to find ways how we can how we can push stronger for that, because I think pure logic um, was not enough for that even over the past year. Uh, health cost you mentioned, uh, I mean, depending on, on which statistics is taken, but we definitely can say that in this region, we speak about billions and that many billions of euros when we speak about health costs only for treating air pollution uh, effects. But our time is running out, and I'm turning now to Davor Pichewski, who is joining us also from Skopje, in front of Bankwatch, which um, is present in 14 countries and monitors public finance institutions and international banks and big investments. Uh, Davor is a long-term activist who started in Skopje and who very soon came to fighting air pollution. Um, but he has a very science-based approach and um, a lot of knowledge uh, in, in previous uh, work experiences and he is the regional air pollution campaign person uh, in front of Bankwatch. So looking forward for what you have to share with us. Thank you.
Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you for the invitation to, to present a little bit of our work here in the limited time we have. Uh, I, I want to start with something that Valeska said at the end of her uh, uh, and at the end of her uh, presentation that uh, <clears throat> uh, the countries need to accelerate the accession process by themselves, by, uh, by implementing what needs to be implemented in, in the chapters. Uh, so uh, uh, instead of uh, doing that, we are kind of moving away constantly because as we see now in the Green Deal and the Green Agenda, uh, for the Western Balkans, uh, the chapters about air pollution are quite different because the, the European Union is now discussing uh, moving to the World Health Organization uh, limits, so implementing even stricter standards for air pollution, and we are still discussing proper implementation of monitoring uh, and, uh, air, and preparing air quality plans, and etc. stuff that should have been done in the previous 10 years since you already know that this is And uh, this, uh, this is connected really strongly to what Bankwatch is doing in the region. Uh, so if we need to take strong, bold steps in fighting air pollution, we need to fight and also to achieve long-term results, results, we need to uh, fight pollution at the source. And, uh, here, I will not repeat a lot of the stuff the surgeon already uh, discussed here. Uh, I mean, we work closely with HEO anyway. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> like, if we are to find uh, to fight pollution at the source, we need to find the biggest sources of pollution. And we already know that energy production is the biggest source of pollution. You know, on average, in Western Balkan countries, around 30% of total emissions of pollutants in the air come from energy production. So uh, this is one of the big steps that we need to take. We should have taken that years ago, but now is like the final time that we need to do this. And uh, in terms of achieving this goal, Bankwatch is uh, fighting for five, six years already to include the air quality direct directive in the energy community treaty. So at least in terms of monitoring and controlling energy production, there will be some stricter standards in the Western Balkan countries. Because uh, I, I will give one example. Uh, the Air Quality Directive has uh, a clause that says for large, uh, large industrial complexes, uh, there needs to be at least one monitoring station downwind of the industry. And this is not implemented in none of the Western Balkan countries. We don't have monitoring stations near the power plants. I mean, with several exceptions. And uh, if we achieve, I mean, it's already on the table, the inclusion of the air quality directive in the energy community treaty. If this, if this happens, uh, we might see some results in the future. Uh, the way we work uh, with, the, uh, with the energy community is that uh, we, provides uh, data to them about pollution near the power plants. We have our own air pollution monitoring device that's, uh, that's certified, that's regularly cal calibrated every year. Uh, we move that device from one power plant to the other in the Balkans. We have been to 16 locations already on some of the locations several times. We have accumulated a huge amount of data about the effects of the coal power plants on air quality and also something that's not discussed a lot, the effects of open pit coal mines and air disposal sites on air quality. So we have concrete evidence that the mines can contribute a lot to, air, to local air pollution. And uh, we are communicating all this data regularly with national decision makers, but also with the energy community, the European Commission. And uh, this, it has been, I would say, I would not say verified, but acknowledged by the Joint Research Center at the European Union, like uh, really good, high quality data sets. So, uh, we, I mean, we can just build on this in the future and achieve what we need to achieve through the green agenda 
for the Western Balkans because we already know what needs to be done. We are, we are speaking about uh, uh, proper monitoring in the green agenda, transborder impacts, and uh, industrial emission directive. Those are the three points. Everything is connected to that. And then we can move on to solving the more complex issues. Like, I mean, we can do it at the same time, I guess, but the more complex issues of household heating and smaller industrial complexes, et cetera. But we need to start with the huge sources that contribute one third of the air pollution in the region. Thank you. Thank you. We, 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 we see that a, no, a lot of knowledge is there and the concrete proposals, how we have to start, but how are we starting and how do you see the fact that, for example, Bosnia and Serbia have announced that they will build new coal power plants together with uh, Chinese financing, um, having in mind what they have signed, what they have obliged themselves to um, that they are under under different processes within the energy treaty community. So, how would you comment that just briefly? Yeah, um, I it's it's happening out under the false pretense that new power plants will solve the air pollution problem in those regions. So, although they're uh, called power plants, so but, yeah. So it, instead of having uh, two old power plants, uh, two slot three and four, for example, uh, that are outdated, they have barely functional filters and everything. And if we replace them with uh, a new block there, then the air pollution problem in the city will be solved. But that's not the case because like I said, uh, when it comes to coal, it's not just about what comes out of the chimney. It's the whole process uh, here. It's the coal mining is the air disposal sites also. Uh, and in Tuzla, for example, there is a huge problem with the air disposal sites. Uh, we have also, we made another analysis of water samples and soil samples from Tuzla. And we see that from six points, six wells that were tested, uh, only one fit in the, into the national criteria for drinking water. Okay. So yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it's not just about air quality here, but still uh, we need to, we need to see that we need to understand and national authorities also need to understand that new coal power plants will not solve pollution problems. They will just prolong them for the next 30, 40 years. And also, I mean, the green agenda, the first point is uh, carbon neutral countries before 2050. So if we are building a new power plant now, it will need to work for 40, 50 years so that it's financially feasible, right? You cannot close it in 2050 and then say, yeah, we spent all this money and that's it. So another proof that paper is patient and takes whatever. Um, I will now turn to Gorian Jovanovsky, who is also joining us from Skopje. Please show us your shirt that will uh, make the introduction uh, easier. Gorian is the founder and developer of the AirCare app, which I think most of us have on their phones and are using at least once on a daily basis. But Gorian is also an activist and, uh, and a local fighter for clean air and was one of our uh, partners uh, in the Balkans United for Clean Air campaign. So please, Gorian, maybe First, introduce us like about monitoring has been mentioned today a couple of times. I think that you, from another perspective, can, can give us more details there. And then um, if you would just like to briefly turn on your activistic side and in particular having in mind then in, with, with regional exchange and uh, joint regional work. Amazing. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, uh, monitoring is crucial. Monitoring is essential. Um, I think six years ago, when I was still a student here, uh, we would uh, uh, air quality was not still that well known among amongst us mortals. Let's say not not amongst the the, um, the people who actually researched it, but, but against regular citizens. Um, and we would even romanticize the smell of winter uh, outside, like oh, it smells on winter. It reminds me of winter break. And uh, a couple of years later, you realize oh, that's smog. We shouldn't be really happy about smelling that. Uh, but it was a problem. 
Um, and monitoring was an issue back then. It still is an issue now, apart from the fact of that we've, we've solved monitoring. Um, but back then, we, I think, locally here had no more than, than 15, 16 measuring stations in, in a country like North Macedonia, which is quite small. Uh, still, that's not enough. Can you can you come closer to to the micro? Your 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 tone is a bit uh, shaky. Let's try this. You've Better, seen the shirt, yes. so I'll just come closer now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We saw the shirt. Now please come closer. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so yeah, back then we had a very limited amount of measuring stations. These are provided by the government, um, and unfortunately are unstable. We would have data. We would not have data, and it's very hard to know. Uh, how the um, improvement process, let's say, and policies that we put forward are actually doing anything about solving air quality when the data is quite shaky or unreliable. On top of that, the less data you have, the less people will talk about it because, hey, we don't know what we're breathing, so might as well not care. Um, and in general, the realization that first, A, we need to make sure that this data that we already have is presented clearly and easily to people so they can digest it, uh, we realize that's a problem. And then second of all, of course, working on the fact that we should have more data because right now still we were kind of in the blind, just like Davaro was saying, you have to go around with actual sensors trying to measure power plants and see if they're actually producing something or not. Um, so at that point, we realized, hey, let's do something about this. Um, I sat down and I made a, a mobile app because phones were a big, starting to be a big thing. It just uses open data from government uh, pollution sensors, from volunteer pollution sensors, which I'll talk about, and from satellite measuring stations for places where we cannot really reach. Takes all of this data and then transforms it in something easy uh, to understand and digest for any human being out there. So anyone who's interested to know, hey, am I breathing clean air outside? I can use air care as an app on my phone to figure out what's going on, or I don't know, my watch or, or any other medium. We're trying to make this as, as easy as possible for a lot of people. And what we saw was when you start sharing this data and making it available to the masses, a lot of people start getting interested because before, let's say, making this data so much available, we would say, yes, maybe there's pollution outside. Sure. Uh, what can we do about it? But suddenly when you realize it's 20 times over EU limits at, at, at given points, you start to freak out. You start to say, OK, no, this is really bad now that I'm breathing. Maybe I can do something about this. And this is, again, where a lot of eco-activist groups started forming, protests started happening in, in capital cities. A lot of these things uh, started uh, awakening people's consciousness about the problems that we're facing with air pollution, both from uh, an unreliable system of laws and regulations, which is old and needs to be updated. We need to move forward as time goes by, um, as well as from our own habits of I don't know, being stuck to our car and saying, hey, I can't, I can't go to the store by walking. It's too far, like 30, 30 meters. I must drive there. Uh, unfortunately, I even have friends which I have to argue about this. I'm like, it's not that far. Um, so we realized it's, it's super important. And um, another interesting fact that we learned, uh, especially in that period, was that we were not alone. At that point, I hadn't done a lot of research about other eco organizations or activists doing anything. And I thought, oh my God, I'm, I'm going to have to fight this alone. I can't. This is too big. But then you started realizing, wait, there's other partners and other organizations throughout, not just our country, but initially our country, um, that were doing the same thing. We said, hey, you know what? Maybe we should start putting our efforts together because together we'll be stronger. Instead of each pulling our own little string, what if, I, what if we try to combine our efforts at least in awakening people's awareness about this problem is how we can go forward and then start putting pressure where pressure needs to be put. Um, and I think... We were doing that quite quite well here locally, and then you guys started coming coming along and and actually gave us an even better idea. When the European Fund for the Balkans showed up uh, last year uh, with an idea about planting trees around the Balkans, we realized, hey, you know, why not come together uh, in the, in the Balkans? In general, we have the same problems, we have the same infrastructure, we have the same mentality. We're all facing similar issues. So if we're all facing similar issues, coming together. And working on these issues together can give us more power to figure out solutions that may work for Sarajevo, but also maybe work for Skopje. Or I don't know, we'll work in Belgrade and then we'll work in Tirana. Uh, these uh, knowledge sharing, these uh, joint ventures together with eco-organizations, activists, governments, anyone who really wants to join and put real effort on this has proven uh, beyond, in my opinion, all doubt that uh, working together will help us overcome this issue in the long run. Uh, we have a lot more to go. 
uh, but we're not giving up. I'm happy to see that our number is growing of everyone who's concerned about this and who's working towards this. So I think that all together, uh, hopefully one day we can breathe clean air and we can all uninstall my app, which I'll be sad about, but actually happy because we don't need it and we'll have a lot of clean air outside. So yeah, you're basically working to ruin your own business model. So that's- Yes, I am. Yeah. Don't tell the investors <laughs> this. Don't tell the investors <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I did not invite so far, but I will definitely now the audience to pose questions if there are any in the Q&A box um, below. We have still a few more minutes to go, so there is time for, for a number of questions. I would just like to take up um, what uh, Valeska also left us, the email for uh, everybody interested in this year's civil society forum, which is in the chat. I hope you see it. If not, I will just read it out. It's CSF 2021 at aspeninstitute.de. So feel free to, to reach out to Valeska and her colleagues. Uh, I don't see any questions in, in the Q&A part. So Either you flashed everybody or you answered already all questions. I don't know. We will never know. Um, I would like to give you um, a quick round of, of a final, final statements um, before, before I close. So Tanya, let's again start with you, please. Yes, thank you very much, Alexandra. First, I have to apologize. Unfortunately, we are still without the power. So that means that um, uh, I do operate uh, only using some batteries. I don't know the uh, technician had to deal with this. That's why I switch off camera. And my apologies to all other panelists. Uh, I didn't want to be rude, but that was the only uh, possibility. Obviously, as Gorian, if you don't mind using the first name basis uh, the mentioned, but all others, um, regional action in uh, respect of the protection of the environment uh, of uh, small and big and medium size is uh, the necessity. Um, I am not promoting the uh, RCC as the organization who might do that, but I am actually promoting the activity of all of us of the um, uh, civil society activists like uh, uh, Goran, Davor, and Sverjanar, so, or uh, you, Alexandra, and your fund, uh, in terms of, first of all, a raising awareness campaign, which are still needed. Uh, not in terms to persuade us that we are living in unhealthy condition, but that we are not uh, powerless in that respect, that we can do the job. Uh, I read this morning and uh, strongly recommend a short interview with Mr. Varoufakis on this uh, uh, on uh, this issue. It might be very illustrative uh, uh, how one person or how persons uh, can do the uh, can do the job. Yes, um, the state authority are needed in order to fulfill the goals which, for which they are paid. But uh, to be aware what are the problems, uh, it is important also uh, this to come uh, from us. And that is one of the most important things for the civil activity uh, nowadays, uh, apart, of course, protection of human rights but the protection of and the story about the climate change and environmental protection is going to be the most important uh, discussion uh, uh, in the years to come not only 2050 2030 but uh, uh, even uh, uh, after that and uh, our job as the regional organization is to accommodate the differences but also to find out the compromise and the best possible solution Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Serjan, you as a, as a final statement before we close. Well, since I didn't mention the vulnerabilities as a word of uh, our economies and the health in the region, I would just finish with a line that we should take uh, seriously the air pollution, the effects on human health, and also speaks about um, the vulnerability of our communities uh, since we are um, 
uh, chipping in from the capital cities from the region. I would love also to mention other small town and the cities across the region, which are also struggling with a huge level of air pollution. And unfortunately, the, the voice of those people are not heard well. And um, so I would support everyone who is sitting out there and also uh, doing the great job uh, and also raising the, the, the questions regarding the effects of air pollution on not only on health again, but also to the economies and, uh, and the economic growth in the future. And I just want to um, call everyone to uh, post the questions to, to the Hill, to, to me personally, and, and also is there any need to provide the technical knowledge support when it comes to the health side of this um, movement, but also just to thank everyone for doing the great job in, in the region. Thank you, Serge. And I, I think that, uh, yeah, maybe decision makers will more and easier understand economic costs and economic opportunities than health costs. So maybe we have to, by addressing them, find just other words and other arguments. Davut, please, you're smiling. Yeah, I'm, I'm smiling about the economic, being above the health impacts. Yeah, it's it's an ironic smile, I would say. Yeah, it's sad but true. Yeah, uh, uh, I'll, I'll be quite short here. Uh, there is one thing that I want to highlight and that is uh, the fastest way to solve all these issues we are discussing here is to work in partnership. So the government and the local authorities and the civil society and the citizens and everyone. It's, it's a joint problem and we can only solve it if we are working together. We have accumulated a lot of data. Uh, we have knowledge that the government has and the government has knowledge that we don't have. We have the capability to, uh, to create critical mass, to, to raise public awareness and uh, we can only solve this if we work together. We, we should really stop discussing uh, which sensors are better, which monitoring stations are the proper ones, etc. It's We know it's polluted, we need to start working and that's it. That's very, very clear and uh, straightforward announcement. And I think that corresponds with, with, with you, Gloria. Totally. I completely agree. I think we, 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 we love to spend time on arguing back and forth, but accepting the reality that we live in a polluted society and actually working towards problems instead of fighting with each other. Um, I think it's a common message that a lot of us organizations try to get through to, um, to, to local governments that, hey, we want to work together on this. We are not an enemy. We're a partner um, in this, but let's sit down and actually try to solve the situation. We cannot allow an economical benefit to outweigh human lives. We are already losing a large amount of human lives. Uh, locally here, it's over 3,000 a year based on recent, uh, recent studies, which is terrible. Um, and yet we try to turn a blind eye on that. Um, I think it's it's super important to start looking at this more seriously. Um, and I think one issue that it's not a Balkan issue, it's a human issue that we need to start understanding is looking at the long term. We are afraid of COVID because on the short, short term, it can harm us and we take it seriously. We're not afraid of air pollution because on the short term, we do not see it as effects. When we do see if it's effects in the long term, is it too late to do anything about it? So instead of just focusing on the short term, let's start thinking of how we can make our lives better down the road, not just for us, for our children, for our grandchildren, and hopefully for a couple other generations, if this world still uh, still sticks around for, for them to be here. So now more than ever, we need to start working on solutions and not going back and forth on, on just discussions. Thank you, very optimistic that we actually have this long-term perspective looking at the global uh, climate uh, emergency ahead of us. So even 2050 is like taken too ambitious and you are here coming with many generations to follow. But uh, I think maybe it's good to close with this kind of optimism. I'm looking at the Q&A box where you are being congratulated um, and uh, where, where you receive thanks to all of you for the determination to a healthier Western Balkans air and environment. We have solidarity from Turkey. So we are all united in toxic air that is killing us. And um, there is one question about foreign investments from China. Uh, I will just briefly comment because we are already running our time. 
It's not Chinese investment, it's the national governments that are allowing them. So they are to be addressed also for, for not allowing all investments that come from abroad. Um, I think it was very interesting. Thank you very much. We have learned really a lot. We heard a lot of different perspectives. Uh, once again, the green agenda is owned by our country. So we have to make our governments accountable, each one of us to at least go for the minimum consensus because more is always better, but let's at least push them all together that they fulfill what they have signed. Uh, I took uh, things like conditional funding, monetary increase, and multi-sectoral approach, which is true for many other sectors, but especially also for this one we discussed today. Um, long term, short term, we are globally at the edge of a transition of, uh, of economic models we have lived so far, just because the resources are finite, the planet is about to collapse, and this will also affect us. I think we have to make sure that our decision makers understand that because they're still stuck in the previous transition, which is still not over and finished. So time is running quicker than they are able to catch up and they need the help of civil society to understand that. And I think by working together as we are facing the same style decision makers um, and by working together regionally, I think we have a bigger chance to, to succeed and at least to get healthier air. It's not even about clean air. We will never get uh, clean air um, everywhere, but at least to get healthy air and air that is not killing us. Thank you once more again, uh, very much to you and to the audience. And yeah, next steps are, are joint activities. So it's definitely not a goodbye, but to see you soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All the best. Bye-bye. 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 Take care. Bye, guys.